<laughs> Thank you. Um, my name is Molly Zuckerman Hartung. What is the experience of the viewer as they walk into the show? I can't speak for anybody else, but I can imagine, and I have had the impression, that there is a lot happening for people, that, there is, that it's a little overwhelming. Um, as you step in to the door of the, the large space, you're greeted by a pretty large painting that seems to declare no <laughs> right away. Um, and then if you want to read the label and think more about it, you're met with a whole lot of thinking that seems to imply that maybe it doesn't just say no. So I think that there's a, there's a lot to contend with. Um, I also get the sense that people really respond to the sensuality of the paintings, that there's a lot that you want to touch. There's a lot of color, a lot of different kinds of color, dark, murky, sort of dense color, bright, saturated, high key, kind of pop color. Um, the second and third rooms in the exhibition are darker and kind of more jewel-like in their color. Um, quieter moments. There's iconic color, like the color of the flag. So there's a lot of different experiences, and there's a lot of things to read, both in the work and in, on the walls. How do, I, uh, how do I start a painting, and this painting, Comic Relief in particular? I, it very much started with the material act of staining. Um, it's a large, canvas and it was unstretched um, in its beginnings and so I began staining the color in and the color by staining I mean that the color is going into raw canvas and absorbing into the grain of the canvas itself um, so if you were to look at the back of this painting you would see the paint having seeped through um, and then at some point it was cut up and paired with other pieces of canvas um, and stretched and then it was unstretched again and then the arms were inserted, um, and those arms are stuffed with old clothing, memories of sorts. Um, and then I put these, these uh, workman's gloves on the ends. Um, and then I thought it was, it was finished. <laughs> this technique that I'm using in this painting is staining, and it's coming out of Helen Frankenthaler's invention really, of staining paint into raw, uh, raw canvas as a kind of painting move. Um, this move was witnessed by Clement Greenberg and uh, Morris Lewis in her studio, and Morris Lewis picked it up and began making, making stained paintings uh, back in the early 60s. And Clement Greenberg, who was there, who was a critic, um, was very committed to and interested in flatness. Flatness was the ultra important modern um, fact. <laughs> the fact of the flatness of the painting was what painting, painting would show its essence by being flat. So um, relief actually in art history refers to the um, on the wall uh, kind of sculptural activity that is it's sort of, you can call it two and a half D, somewhere between sculpture and painting. So the, this painting has a literal relief. Um, it is not flat, it comes out at you. So I think the, the joke of pairing stain painting with something that's coming out at you um, already produces a kind of re relief and maybe also a, a relief, like thank goodness. Whew. We don't have to contend with modernism and it's um, painting qua painting activities. And maybe that's funny. And the three arms is kind of a direct reference to something like the Three Stooges or the Three Amigos or any sort of... Uh, I always think, last thing I'll say, I always think that pairs and threes um, are, are sort of inherently about humor. Um, I, used to, I taught a class once called Stupidity and we spent the entire semester um, discussing doubles, pairs, buddies. Because you're never funny by yourself. You're only funny when somebody laughs at you and starts pointing out your behavior as comedic in some way. Um, so Beckett and many others have produced really fabulous duos. Thinking about Lurch in particular in a temporal sense. I mean, I think the 
The bottom section, um, this is the, the kind of foot of the painting, um, is maybe most obviously a kind of rhythmic structure, um, that it's just black and white and kind of in a checked pattern. Um, maybe, maybe one might picture the keys on the piano and start thinking about that kind of um, rhythm structure. I often think about stairwells. I, I draw stairwells a lot. So I, I, I think about spaces that produce a kind of temporal experience. Um, maybe that seems a bit obscure, but that there's a way that, you know, you count the steps as you're going up them. Um, that there's a, that the, yeah, that, that space has a temporal dimension to it. I guess, and I think that, that in that painting that was really feeling strong to me. I think also putting objects like the t-shirts, there's kind of memories um, stuck into that painting and I think that there's a lot of, there's a lot of thinking about how the materials hold time and how they're deteriorating, how you might think about like, is this gonna fall apart? Is this already falling apart? So those are some te temporal dimensions. And then it's interesting, you're talking about the three-part structure, which I think, I think it's a kind of musicality um, that, yeah, that's really built in. I think also this kind of putting paintings together and taking them apart or having that experience when you look at it that you think um, it seems like this was sort of reconfigured. I think that's also a kind of temporal experience rather than a spatial experience per se. But I think, you know, I'm interested in the kind of back and forth between those. For the last four years, I've taught um, a class called Space and Abstraction at Yale to undergrads. And I was given the class by Anoka Faruqi. Um, and at first, I really had no idea what she was talking about. Because for me, coming out of a literature and writing and theory background, it was always temporality that I was thinking about. I was always really focused on time. Eventually that became an interest in rhythm, um, but space was just not a word I was using. I think when you say space, the first thing that pops into my head is um, the way that when you sew curves together, um, the, the material doesn't sit flat. On, on the surface. In fact, the reason I started using the curve came out of just a, a wearing of material and a love of the bias, which is the diagonal, stretchy, um, if you have, if you have the, the grid of, the, of a weave of most textiles, you can stretch it on the diagonal. You can't stretch it on the, on the grid, on the horizontal or the vertical. Um, and that stretch is called the bias, and in clothing construction, bias cut materials um, go around a curvy body in a way that um, non-bias cut materials don't. It gives the fabric a kind of give. So I was working with ideas of, of curves in all these different ways in that painting, Chaos and Cosmos, um, and also working with materials from many different um, activities, um, including purchased materials from Joanne's Fabrics and re, uh, other paintings that I was cutting up and recycling into it. Um, but I think when you talk about the space, it's, it's very not flat. Um, it's strong relief, right? There are pockets that you almost feel like you could uh, put something inside of. You could rest a, you know, a bottle of water in one of those pouches. Um, and that was really satisfying to me. To, to begin, I'll say that that painting did not begin with Notley. Um, that painting began with a very large drop cloth painted with multiple coats of latex paint. Uh, at least three. I was saying earlier two, but I think it was more like three. So using a roller on the ground, painting a giant drop cloth um, with latex, like house paint, right? Many coats of house paint. Um, beginning to think, how can I make a large work? through this act of painting and sanding. So I started sanding it down so multiple layers of paint could kind of show through. So it was more about preparing the surface. And this painting was gonna go into the Whitney. So I started thinking of, that I wanted it to be a text painting and that I wanted it to say no. And then I started arguing with the no and thinking what do I mean by no and how can I, 
how can I fill that no with with a kind of ambivalence, a kind of richness? How can I make it say more than what people think as just no? Um, and I had been reading a lot of Alice Notley's poetry and was really loving it, and was really loving the way that it felt to me like she builds a poem in the same way that I build a painting. Um, and she literally also makes collages, material collages. So I thought there was a kinship, and I thought since this painting was going to go into a high-profile public exhibition, the Whitney Biennial, people know about that who, who exist well beyond the, the art world. Um, so I thought it would be a kind, of, a kind of possible hailing, that I could sort of say, hey, Alice, I love your work. Um, and that the painting could do these, these multiple things. But that it could also be a strong political no. Um, I think maybe it was 2014, so it was before certain political situations that we have now lived through. Um, but I think people, people thinking about what the power of no is, what the power of a critique is, um, was important to me. I would definitely agree that I have been trying to queer painting. And I think the way I would want to talk about it is queerness as an experience in which you don't understand the conventions because they're not working for you, right? So there's ways in which gender performances in the world are treated as given in, in like deep ways. And to be queer is to be a kid not understanding how you're supposed to dress, how you're supposed to stand, how you're supposed to interact with other people, how you're supposed to smile or whatever, right? To, to really just not get it because you're just oriented differently. You're paying attention to different things. So that was my experience as a kid and I think it's most queer people's experience. And I think in painting, what I love is that painting is full of conventions. It's full of rules that are taken as givens. The handshake is a convention that we all understand, you know? Um, but some people high five, they don't handshake, you know? There's plenty of other ways to greet. <laughs> so I think with painting, the wall, the stretcher, the flatness, these are all just conventions. And I've just been intrigued by uh, setting up a system in which you expect the convention, but something else might happen. One of the classic ones is just, um, the backside of the painting, being interested in the backside. So one of the reasons I reconfigure paintings is because sometimes I'm turning them over and bringing what was the back to the front. Um, but there's a lot of different ways I do that. Any of the paintings that are stitched, um, the sewing, um, it's funny, people can't always even tell that they were sewn, but that sewing happens on a machine and then it gets stretched. But very often it gets stretched and it gets unstretched and it gets cut and it gets sewn, and it gets re-stretched. So there's this, this, um, this taking apart, this deconstruction, this dis dismantling, and then this reconstructing that's taking place. So anywhere you see stitching, the stitching had to happen before it was stretched, but you can understand that it already had a relationship to being stretched, and it, and it moved. The chaos and cosmos that we talked about, it's, it's one painting that's been cut and reconfigured. Um, orientations change. Um, Caliph, maybe this is an interesting, Caliph is the blue painting in, in the other room. It's got very fat seams behind it. So what I find amusing or pleasurable about that painting is that it's a very excessive piece of fabric. It's much, much, much larger than what it looks like. And um, it's like I took it in. It's like, I'm, you know, it's, so it's got these big fat seams in the back. And I, I often think I'd like to show the back um, because there's no cuts. There's just lots and lots of excess fabric. And I guess I think about that excess as being a kind of queerness, that there's, there's just too much here. And you'll only see this much, but there's always more. That table, the aluminum foil table, is the thing that we got to invent for this show. Um, and we thought, well, and also those doorways. And I think that the pointy doorways and the aluminum foil table maybe feel similar and that maybe they feel like elementary school spaceship or something, right? Like I, I, I love early childhood development, like 
toys. Like, I love craft projects, you know? I loved, like, black tempera paint over crayon and scratching into it. Like, that feeling of, like, being able to, to make something when you're a kid is really powerful. And so I guess that aluminum foil table was, I wanted it to feel like something that somebody would want to play at. Like, I don't know, I guess I just kept thinking aluminum foil would feel magical and also banal. You know, not actual magic, but just like, you know, you get all the pots and pans out of the cupboards and you sit on the ground and you can make music out of them. <laughs> That's how I wanted it to feel. One thing I'll say, one beautiful thing, is just that I, I find the spine and the kind of reference to the spine or the center. Um, it's also Barnett Newman zip. It's where I first got it. It's where I decided that I would use, use this structure because the book has a spine, but also painting history has this, this zip. Um, and seeing the way that that runs through the show feels really exciting to me and the way it shifts, the way it means it means differently in different paintings. I find that very exciting, that it's sort of like in deconstruction, um, that a word can mean differently in different contexts, that it can flip around, um, that it can become a pun. I think the spine has really shocked me with its uh, enduring potential for both humor and seriousness and embodiment. The other thing I would say is that the work is way more um, emotional than I thought. By emotional, maybe I mean gestural. I didn't quite realize how, like I think this painting methodology is really sad. Um, I think that there's, there's a kind of a, there's a kind of a mania or a speed to the way that I talk or work or teach. Um, and then there's a lot of underlying kind of melancholy, I think, in the work. And I think I didn't know how that would feel. So for me, it's, I don't think it's just me, though. My, my partner sees it, too, <laughs> that there's a kind of like underlying sadness. And I'm really, I guess, happy to see that. Um, I'm reassured that that's there. We haven't really in any conversation talked about the Betty Boop painting, um, Baby Esther, or the flag painting, and those are maybe the most iconic, overt, representational, sort of political representational paintings in the show, and I haven't talked about them that much. Um, and I wouldn't say it's the prominent part of my work, but I think the other surprise of the show was that there is this kind of pop politics in the work. Um, so I would hope that people get interested in, in the history of Betty Boop. Um, it's, it's one of the many histories in American culture that's, um, that's whitewashing. So Betty Boop's origins are um, in early 20th century black performers, female performers. And she was turned into this little white figure, this little white cartoon. And she is the first female cartoon animated figure in, in animated history. Um, but she's, she's an appropriation and she's a whitewashing. And I found that really interesting and I made the painting, geez, seven years ago or something. And then I didn't even know if I had the right to exhibit it or talk about it. Um, these questions of representation and politics are, are hard. But I am excited it's in the show and I'm nervous that it's in the show. But I hope people look into it. I hope people think about it. Um, yeah. That's in the wall text, so if you listen to it, you'll hear me talk about it. Yeah. But, and I think it's the same for the flag, right? What do we do with that thing? What does that mean for us? It means something different for everybody. And it was a whole thing, just putting it in the painting. It's somewhat illegal. It's sort of illegal to sell it. Um, it's, a, it's a problematic object. And so I hope that's intriguing to young people who are thinking about representation in painting. When you're teaching, you're constantly realizing how difficult these ideas are, how abstract painting is not self-evident. Self and 
I think experiencing students' questions or problems or hurdles or confusions or stubbornness all and the t changing of the times. I mean, when I was painting, there was just at the beginning in grad school, there was a very different discourse than there is now. And all of that is, um, just causes me to rethink everything I think I know a lot. And it's, that's very confusing, you know? And I, so I think there's a, I just keep like sort of trying to keep letting the world in. Um, and I think that's maybe a bad idea for an artist. Maybe an artist needs to find a position and stick to it. And I do have a position on the other hand, but the position keeps trying to experiment with new ways to share itself. It's a, they're definitely related though. My, uh, the director of, of my New York gallery asked me that the other day in, in my studio. She said, are you always experimenting? <laughs> do, do you ever just produce, you know? I guess not, I guess not. <laughs> um, it's, it's a question I'm really working with these days though. I'm thinking about it a lot.